Welcome to the Church of God Network podcast, everybody. I am here with who was our first guest on the Church of God podcast, Church of God Network podcast, like a year and a half ago ish. Stephen Russo, my brother. Uh, we've been talking about getting him back on the pod again for a while. Uh, I would say you probably recognize him for the po- first podcast episode, but the first episode was audio only. I mean, man, we were still living together. You were in New York. It was back at the yeah. apartment. Now you're in Maryland. Mm-hmm. We're both homeowners. So yes. A lot has changed in a short period of time. But uh, yeah, a lot definitely just... has changed. That's for sure. Yeah. I mean, we'll probably, we're hoping to get you back on for more episodes too, just because at the very least, uh, it's a good excuse for us to catch up and, and discuss some things that we've been studying and, and thinking about because uh, I think listeners will sort of get a, a window into what it's like when when one of us visits the other one and we start getting into a conversation and catching up on the stuff we've been thinking about since we last caught up. And that's really what today's topic is. I remember, yeah, was it your birthday last year or it was one time I came to visit you and like right off the bat, we got into the subject of human evil. And that's what the podcast mm-hmm. is going to be about today. And it was, we just got right into it. And it was because if I remember correctly, not only were you reading a particular book, but you were also, I think, studying certain things. I remember, I think probably just because my life, it was the same, your late twenties, early thirties, you start looking at yourself and, uh, society and the church and, and human nature. And you're sort of digging into that whole thing. Um, so maybe we could start off cause you know, you don't need any more introduction. People know who you are. Uh, yeah. the, uh your background, <laughs> I think, and professionally we'll, we'll leave to the next podcast we do cause it's more relevant there. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. but for, for folks, uh, listening and, and watching, Maybe you could give a little bit of a synopsis about what made you start to be interested in this concept of evil, uh, sort of the role that everyone plays in it, how it relates to God's plan on earth, you know, sort of what you what got you interested in this topic. Yeah, so it's it's really interesting because it's a multifaceted thing for me, because like, as you said, and there's definitely an aspect of introversion, or introversion, introspection, combined two words there, mm-hmm. that goes into this aspect where like, okay, you know, you read Romans seven, you read so many of these, uh, especially in Romans and the things that Paul talks about, he really hits on a lot of really important aspects of, especially around Passover time. And we're recording this around Passover, probably won't come out until after, but these are the kind of topics that are really important, but you know, it, it's interesting because it actually hit me when I was actually, I was watching a TV show that I really enjoy. And it's interesting because one of the things I've realized is that when you look at media, hum- like humans meet like media, what they focus on. Sometimes you get a little bit of a glimpse into the things that they really care about. And so in this particular mm-hmm. one, it's not American, it's not American media. So I think that's part of it, but a bunch of episodes start talking about this idea of evil and this idea of how, you know, sometimes it's, it's a matter of like the way you grew up, right? It's circum. Sometimes it's circumstance. And, and then of course, in the midst of all that, I also started reading as you were alluding to this book by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the Gulag Archipelago, uh, very, for those who might be in the know or who listen to, uh, Jordan Peterson, he quotes him quite a lot. Peterson, that was definitely influenced a lot by, by, um, by Solzhenitsyn here. And Peterson actually is the one, cause I started listening to Peterson maybe five, six years ago and he mentioned souls understand like three or four podcast episodes. And I was like, who is this guy? I need to get this book. So I finally did. And as you can see, I have all these little notes here for some quotes that we'll probably get to later on in the podcast. And as reading that, I was like, this guy has, he has some insight that I think is very important that I think that is connected to scripture. And that's to your point where, because of that, I was, I started thinking, you know, I don't think I've actually ever heard a message just on the nature of evil, just like on that idea. People talk about evil things a lot, but we don't talk about the definition of evil. And dig into it. Yeah. And I know we'll we'll dig into that later. So I don't want to get too far ahead, but that's pretty much what drove me along with this particular topic, a couple of different mediums. It is interesting too, because you and I mean, you and I obviously grew up in similar environments. And so there's a lot of overlap in terms of what we talk about and think about. But, you know, for a long time, I was always interested in like psychology. So uh, M. Scott Peck, John Bradshaw, Mm -hmm. um, 
how how humans develop for better or worse, things like that. We've sort of and on podcasts gone into things like addiction and sort yeah. of the the going from a 30,000 foot view of sin and human nature down into the weeds a bit to explore. And this is, I think, sort of the next iteration. And you and I really hit it off on this topic over the last year. And yeah. for some context about um, Gulag Archipelago, which is the book you, you referenced, uh, could you tell us a little bit, just so people know who he is, if they're not familiar, about who Solzhenitsyn yeah. was and what the book is about, why he wrote it? Yeah, so the book, he I think he wrote it in two different sections. Uh, this The book I have is part one, and I believe he has part two, which I think is about half the size. This is about a 600-page book. And he talks about when he was first arrested. So he was, I, if I remember correctly, he was an officer. I don't remember if he was a captain or colonel, but he was an officer in the Soviet Army during World War II. And he was corresponding with a friend of his. And I don't remember if this friend was back in Moscow or if it was in a different regiment. But anyway, writing things that were slightly skeptical of the Soviet government. Yeah. And of course, this is the Soviet Union in, in mid 40s. So he his mail was read, he was arrested, and he was put into the into the prisons in in Moscow. He's moved around to a couple of different places, the most famous being the Lubyanka, which is yep. the famous like famous uh, prison that was like right smack dab in the middle of Moscow. I might even be in Red Square at the time. And so he oh, wow. kind of talks about, yeah, like it, it's, if, and it wasn't the KGB back then. I think it was like the NKVD or something was the acronym for the, the state security. But like, yeah, their main prison was like in their basement. And so, and then because they had other facilities in uh, across like Moscow area and other places, because mm -hmm. the Gulag archipelago is, if you know what like an archipelago is in geography, it's, all, it's a chain of islands. And so this is just saying like, they have these prisons, these gulags across Russia. And he's talking about them because really this book is about his experience in those prisons, but primarily it's also about the stories of men that he met while in prison. He, I think if you, if I remember correctly, what he actually did was wrote everything down on like napkins and like his entire book when he wrote, like wrote while in prison and wrote after when he was released, I think in the seventies or maybe even like the late sixties. And the book was, of course, banned in Russia because it was mm -hmm. it was published during the yeah. Soviet Union, and but got a lot of traction here. Uh, I think I think some people even credit it with like the beginning of the fall of the Soviet Union because it really dove mm -hmm. into the complete and and utter nonsense that was the Soviet system from the from its inception. He goes yeah. into background of the law and all this kind of stuff, and it all kind of ties into this idea of evil even though he talks specifically about evil in a couple of different places but that's generally what he wanted to do he wanted to share people's story yeah. including his own about the evil that the state can do and you know it's interesting because obviously this podcast won't be a, a political one and that book largely was a commentary on the soviet union and dangers of uh sort of state action or really mob rule too by an extent uh, mm -hmm. or to an extent. And, um, but I think the insights he has on human nature are really valuable and yeah. are applicable across any society, across any time period and applicable to the church, applicable to, um, our understanding of God's plan even. And I sort of want to use some of the quotes you've brought to me, uh, as jumping off points to discuss larger issues, uh, relating to scripture and conversion and whatnot. But I think the first yeah. thing since people now have an overview about the sort of context of the book, how we got into it, what the perspective it's coming from, we should probably talk about what evil is specifically rather than have it be an ambiguous term. And, and I say that yeah. fully recognizing that it sort of is an <laughs> ambiguous term because it's not yeah. your point. When we were doing the planning call for this, you were saying, and, and it's true, you know, sin has a, has a very explicit definition in scripture. There are things that have very explicit yeah. definitions Evil is a more a broad term, and even mm -hmm. in society, is very broad. It's very subjective, and it very much is loaded with the each individual's own thinking about things. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we want to talk about today is how we've yeah. distorted what evil is uh, in ways yeah. that I think are very subtle but very impactful in, in ways I don't think many of us uh, realize. And it, certainly there were some, especially you mentioned media, and we'll get into that in a bit. Some things that yeah. I didn't realize 
uh, until you take a step back or someone articulates it and go, wow, yeah, that is true. We do that as a society and it's incredibly dangerous. Um, but I know you, that's something you've been thinking about. Did you have any comments about the nature of evil from like a, a more of a scriptural, um, perspective? Yeah. So one of the things, cause that, as you mentioned, right, the, the definition of evil in scripture is, is pretty vague and it makes it even more challenging when you have so many different words that describe different aspects right and we have yeah especially in the old testament right we use words like iniquity and wicked and abomination and then you also on top of that have the i guess the metaphorical words right the unholy un well unrighteousness would be one of those that'd be more like straight like a like an abomination but unholy unclean so they all kind of paint this picture of the opposite of God's character. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I think so far, and of course my, my study on evil is very much incomplete. And honestly, like I'm trying to prepare a message on this topic. And even after I put together a message, it's probably going to still be very incomplete because I mean, just between those eight or nine words that I listed, I mean, you're talking several hundred instances in scripture when those are all mentioned. But I think the key part is, especially when you go back to the two trees and you look at the tree, the knowledge, the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil, understanding that there is a separation between those things. And so when I look at scripture and I look at everything, the, the simplest definition of evil that I can come to understand. And I think that makes sense to me is that evil is anything that separates us from God. Because when you look at what Adam and Eve did, taking of the two trees that right, just taking of the two trees and put and put them out and then created the whole last thing right because if if you were to tell somebody who wasn't a christian who had no idea what the bible was what do you think the first uh sin is maybe they had an understanding of right and wrong so do you think what's the first wrong thing that adam and eve did what do you think they would say right like maybe murder or something really bad right like because we we tend to say those things are much worse but no it was just disobeying an, or, a, a direct command from god that was it that's yeah. what put them out and then i know we were talking about this in the planning call too that decision then led to murder the next very the next generation generation over yeah and that's yeah I mean, there's, there's just i mean we're gonna get into it but there's just so much to talk about on this subject because interesting enough i had been thinking i sort of tabled it for a while but years ago i was thinking you know it's going through my own things in my 20s and you start realizing you have the 10 commandments and you have things that are explicitly sin but you have all these other things that don't feel right they separate you from god they don't feel like something that Mm -hmm. brings you closer to the mind of christ and it could be something like um when you're too when a a a romantic relationship is too high a priority or, or too much of a focus in your life when you're obsessed over something like uh your job or Um, the things that we do to self-medicate and take us out of, uh, our stressors or whatever, a lot of them might not be explicitly sinful, but the, the mechanism of needing to do that does bring you away from God, but you can't necessarily directly say, oh, you're breaking this commandment. So I've always wondered like, what is that Mm -hmm. gray area? And I think this touches on it, right? It's anything that is con maybe I'd phrase it. Anything that is contrary to the mind of Christ in the way of God would be the yeah. way I'd phrase it, but it's like same, same to your point. Um, I think this is probably a good place to start with the Solzhenitsyn quotes. Cause we'll start with yeah, the one that I think totally. everyone has heard. You might not know it's a Solzhenitsyn quote, but it's a, a very famous line that people use quite often. Um, Steve, I think you probably know which one I'm talking about without having to yep. get a hint, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I totally do. And um, let me read, I, since I'm going to read directly from the book in a lot of these. So so you, so people who have read the book or maybe have listened to Jordan Peterson or other people talk about this, of course, since it's translated from Russian, it'll be a slightly different translation than maybe you're familiar with. Yeah. But this is something to uh, keep in mind as we go through. So let's find it right here. Yeah, so I'll read the full quote. So you'll probably get to a point where you're like, oh, I remember, I recognize this quote. Yeah. So here's this is what Solzhenitsyn says, talking about uh, different things, about like executioners and things. He says, if only it were so simple, if only there were evil people were somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and they were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being and who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart. 
Yeah. That's to me, like there are, there are moments where even people who are not converted touch on an element of truth and it's very moving. They have a moving way of, yeah. of phrasing it or something. I mean, I, I think I told very you poetic. Before. Yeah. Or one of our, our, our mutual friends, I think I've told you this story. I think I even shared it on the podcast, but someone uh, mm. who basically is not only not in the church of God, but like only on the outskirts of religion, she's sort of like a, a theist or something very progressive. And she's like, you know what? I think this is hell. And I'm like, you are so much closer to the truth than you <laughs> realize. And so this is another yeah. one of those things where evil, the, the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every man. That is such mm -hmm. a important concept uh, to keep in mind because of that's, that's the heart of the gospel. It's the heart of God's plan. Like you said, it's the, it's the um, air of the decision with the two trees. You take of the tree of the knowledge, good and evil. And now mankind is taking on to them onto themselves to determine good and evil. And every one of us has evil in us, even in the church. We're going through conversion. Yeah. We've not finished that process. And so we are mm -hmm. just as capable of committing evil as anyone else. And the first point that you mentioned too, about if only there were bad people who you can just cut off and kill or, or section off, and then we'd be yeah. better. That's what ruins mankind. It's people who... Um, think they're doing something righteous. Think, man, if we could just get mm -hmm. rid of these bad people, we'd be better off. And what you don't realize is you have the same capacity for evil, either deliberately yeah. because you're selfish or accidentally because you don't have full uh, information. Yeah, it's there's so many thoughts going through my head. So one of, connecting back to what you were saying, I guess in the beginning part of that about all right. As Solzhenitsyn was saying, evil cutting through the heart of every man or every human being, as this translation says, it reminds me of Romans seven, as I mentioned earlier, yeah. right? Like that whole section, right? Yeah. I do not do the, I do not do the good that I want. I do the, or, but I, and I, but I do the evil I do not want. That whole thing is, is such an important part. And then it also connects with the aspect of just, as you said, right? Like we may be in the process of conversion and we may have made that commitment. But as Paul says in Philippians two, he's like, he has not attained yet. There's mm -hmm. a process that you have to go through and that, and this is part of that process. This is the process of character building where we have to be able to choose either side. And then to your point about this idea, like that, like the, the point of, you know, only if there were this group of people we just put over here. I think it's also really important to look at that. I mean, obviously, not specific. I'm not going to name names or name political parties, but I think it's also a it's a mindset that impacts how we view the rest of the world, and mm -hmm. and very much through like the state. I mean, part of this is what he's talking about here is from a state's perspective, because that was the pers that, that was the perspective of this of the Soviet Union. We get rid of the bad people, and everything's fine. Yeah. But of course, their definition of bad changed because one of the sections he talks about literally here is they would arrest people and then write the law to convict them. Yeah. Well, it's even, right. it, I mean, it's, it goes back to, to the, the episode Corbin and I did about, about politics is that uh, our country is no different. It's in terms yeah. of the Republicans think if you got rid of the, the Democrats, we'd be better off and vice versa. It's you. Yeah. And, and that's also the problem with people who believe in these global conspiracy uh, uh, beliefs in terms of, you know, the Rothschilds and the Illuminati. And because what essentially these things are rooted in, forget the anti-Semitic roots, which came out of the Soviet Union, uh, or at least in Russia, pre-Soviet Union, Russia, pre yeah, Union, the, the czar, actually, czarist. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it came out of that, that era, but also what's built into that, uh, line of thinking is, oh, the world is, it's, it's a way to make sense of the world. And for, for people who believe mm -hmm. that it's, yeah. oh, well, there are good guys. The average person, we're good guys, but there is this cabal of evil people ruining the planet. And if we could just mm -hmm. expose them, we'd be better off. But the thing that the church, we in the church of God need to understand is we are capable of evil. We were capable of evil yes. before, before we were baptized. We are capable of evil now. We do things on a daily basis that are evil. It's not that you murder someone yeah. once a week, but you do things that, that, are very human that hurt relationships that are contrary to God. And what we're called to is pursue the nature of Christ and want to live God's way of life. But knowing that that's 
for for fallible humans who don't have the full picture, it is a process. It's about working towards yeah. it. It's not about being a fully uh, finished product. Yeah, and and to that point, I'm glad you mentioned the word fallible because I think one of the things that really helped me not be so angry in politics was this idea. And, and granted, it's bring up a different author, but an equally amazing one. One of my favorites, Thomas Sowell, his book there, yeah. on conflict of visions. He yeah. talks about how there are two general visions in the world, and I and I think it's and I think it connects really well, Solzhenitsyn, that human beings are perfectible versus human beings are flawed. And that's the basis for all of our decisions. And that's the basis for all of government decisions. I mean, for, I think for a really long time, the US government was based on the fundamental principle that human beings were flawed. I think that has changed. I think that changed a long time ago. And I, you look at the rest of the world, their fundamental principle is human beings are perfectible. And I think sometimes in the church, we lean in that regard because it's just like, oh, well, if we just get, as you mentioned, right, if we just get rid of the evil people that are doing bad things, we'll be okay. But then we realize we are no better than Israel because Israel had God in their midst and we have God in our midst in that regard. Like we have Christ in us and we still commit sin each and every day. And it's it's one of those, I think every group, even if you're a group that subscribes to the idea that mankind is fallible and therefore not perfectible. I think it is human nature to act as though we are perfectible. Yeah. Like it, I think that because yeah. of Adam and Eve's decision and I, and in the church, I think mm -hmm. it manifests itself by thinking we are somehow fundamentally different than the rest of the world in terms of our capacity. When in general, we have a down payment of God's spirit. We are called to, yeah. to change and to grow. And we are called to be oriented towards him and judgment starts with the church of God. So we are yeah. held to a different standard, but I think to our detriment, we, we neglect the difficulty of the human experience and the damage that things that <clears throat> might not be, like we said, murder or whatever, or adultery. And those things happen too, even in the church of God, but mm -hmm. the, yeah. we downplay the, the, our capacity for, for evil and, and destruction. And one of the things that's interesting is the last point of that uh, quote by Solzhenitsyn is that uh, since evil cuts through the heart of every man who is willing, I, I'm paraphrasing, who's willing to, to kill a part yeah. of himself, right? Destroy a part of himself. Yeah. Yeah, I can even, yeah. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? When what's interesting, again, I have it yeah. written down. Romans 6 talks about mm -hmm. knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, Christ, that the body of sin yeah. might be destroyed. And henceforth, we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we are dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. The idea of being, of the of having to kill the old man, the idea that conversion mm -hmm. is a process of God tearing down the structure and rebuilding it with the foundation of Jesus Christ is central to the gospel and central to conversion. That is the thing that needs to happen because yeah. of what Adam and Eve decided and what we have all been doing since then. And so yeah. Solzhenitsyn is, is tapping into an element of one of the most fundamental truths about what God is, is working out. And that is, yes, we all have to kill a part of ourselves. That part of us, when we get into conflict with people in the church, when we have to admit we're wrong, when we have to be humble, when we have to work through difficult issues, we have to continually yeah. be killing our ourselves in some sort of way as we yeah. move towards Christ, getting rid of the old man and mm -hmm. taking in the nature of Christ. And as you mentioned, next week starts that the, the symbolism of that process with unleavened bread. You know, people will be listening to this a couple of weeks after that, but very appropriate timing. Yeah. And I think to your point, and to what we've already mentioned, like we mentioned Romans 7, we mentioned Romans 6, and of course, putting to death the deeds of flesh is in Romans 8, and that entire section, yep. right? When, in, when Paul says in, in verse 7 of Romans 8, really, the carnal mind is enmity, it's hatred, it hates God. Yeah. And so, and this is exactly, I mean, it's part of what Solzhenitsyn is saying, because even when you look across the world, right, like the carnal mind might hate God. But like people do well, I think I think that's one of the important things that Mr. Armstrong used to hammer on is that there are people who do good, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean they're called, and it doesn't mean that they can't do evil if you can also do good. And and the you know it's interesting to transition to the next thing too, in terms of manifestations of evil. The the second quote I know that that's going to be really big for us is the one about. Um, 
media and and sort of the narratives we tell ourselves as a society, which I think is hugely yes. important because one of the things that I'm also interested in is human development. And I've largely read about that in the capacity of family dynamics, um, addiction. I'm also very interested not only about how why people do terrible things, not only on like the the state level and, and political level, so you know, Gulag Archipelago, Nazi Germany, mm-hmm. uh, but also the worst how the worst parts of humankind become manifest like i feel like serial killers have to be the the epitome of the worst thing about mankind it's someone whose addiction and compulsion Mm -hmm. and and uh emotional crutch is literally taking human life and elements around that yeah and usually you mentioned uh decision that adam and eve made and that decision one generation later led to Cain killing Abel. Think about that. It doesn't, it yeah. doesn't say that, that there, I mean, we don't know, but uh, Adam and Eve didn't kill anyone. Adam and Eve didn't do anything that you would imagine would have led to that same thing. You get a woman who is, because it's usually the mother it, it, when it comes to creating a lot and of these guys. With, with serial killers. Yeah. With, yeah, with, men, with men. men. Yeah. And yeah. She has a bad experience in her relationship. I'm overly simplifying this, but this is a very common thing. She becomes resentful of men because she's been treated terribly. She takes it out on her son. Everyone's going to know that that dynamic isn't healthy, but that creates, a in, in many cases, especially if you might have a certain uh, genetic predisposition or the right set of circumstances mm-hmm. and right er, uh, things happening early on in life, then all of a sudden that yeah. that person winds up a killer. Like we don't... Yeah. It's not just killers that beget killers. Our human evil is much more sinister in its uh, applicability. And so I have something to bring up in a book that I uh, uh, am a big fan of, but I want you to read the Solzhenitsyn mm-hmm. quote first, because this is another, this one was the one that struck me uh, most when you and I were talking. Yeah. And I'll read the quote and then, yeah, cause I definitely have some comments here because I mentioned media earlier. I definitely yeah. want to, and I'll, we could talk more about that, but yeah, let me just read it here and let me find out where I want to start. Because this is a bit of a longer quote. I'll try to read. I'll try to read all of it. But okay. as you'll see, because there's a lot to unpack here. So um, he, in this particular situation, he's actually talking about an alleged security guy who would use prisoners for target practice. And then he says, "Just how are we to understand that this man's actions as an act of an evildoer? What sort of behavior is it? Do such people really exist?" We would prefer to say that such people cannot exist, that there aren't any. It is permissible to portray evildoers in the story for children so as to keep the picture simple. But when the great world literature of the past, Shakespeare, Schiller, Dickens, inflates and inflates images of evildoers to the blackest of shades, it seems somewhat farcical and clumsy to our contemporary perception. The trouble lies in the way these classic evildoers are pictured. They recognize themselves as evildoers, and they know their souls are black. And they reason, I cannot live unless I do evil. So I'll set my father against my brother. I'll drink the victim's sufferings until I'm drunk with them. Iago even, or very precisely, identifies his purposes and his motives as being black and born of hate. But no, it's that's not the way it is. To do evil, a human being must first of all believe that what he's doing is good, or else that it's a well-considered act in conformity for, with natural law. Fortunately, it is the nature of the human being to seek a justification for his actions. Macbeth's self-justifications were feeble, and his conscience devoured him. Yes, even Iago was a little lamb. This imagination and the spiritual spirit strength of Shakespeare's evildoers stopped short at a dozen corpses because they had no ideology. Ideology, that is what gives evil doing its long-sought justification and gives the evildoer the necessary steadfastness and determination. The, that is the social theory which helps to make his acts seem good instead of bad in his own and others' eyes, so that he won't hear reproaches and curses, but will receive praise and honors. And then I won't go into it, but he gives two very, or actually three examples. I don't know who the Jacobins are. I don't know much about them. Mm-hmm. But he talks about Nazis mm-hmm. and the Inquisition. Yeah. And so... Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. So I'll. Well, I'll just. I, I want to. Uh, I want to synthesize something that is the takeaway from that. Something we talked about, and then I want to get your opinion on what I said before, and then what I'm going to say now. Yeah. But that is 
so reading that, the takeaway is society, and especially, I, I I would encourage the listener and viewer to to think about this in light of media. I don't mean um, news media. I mean store like books, film, uh, music, um, uh, stories we tell ourselves in society, uh, entertainment by and large. Because what he's saying is the way pretty much every society looks at evil is let's say you watch a movie the bad guy knows he's the bad guy and he knows mm-hmm. he's evil and everyone who's good knows they're good and they're fighting the bad guys right and we even portray that on a political level right it's it's good yeah. versus evil in world war ii right it's mm-hmm. the nazis are evil they know they're evil we we're the good guys we're safe and we we turn good and evil into a black and white thing where evil knows it's evil. When in the in reality, human suffering is caused by people thinking they're doing good, and we all mm-hmm. contribute to that. Yeah. And the 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 thing is that main like media and entertainment they do such a disservice by making evil know that they are evil and not portraying humanity uh in the complexity that it that it really is that that it really has yeah and so i don't want to i don't mean to rip on one particular movie just the one that comes up to me is something like the notebook right a little cliche Mm -hmm. but the main like it's it's supposed to be a romance thing it's very common in romance movies in your the even when maybe there's not a bad guy right because not really a bad guy in the notebook but you can tell early on if you're if you're trying to be conscious of it, uh, and if not, you could feel it because that's where the the movie the filmmaker is taking you. That there's a moral I am trying to push here. There is a there is a point I am trying to push. Whether it's um, this is what's right, uh, or you should just pursue relationships that make you happy is the underlying tone. Whatever it is, but in reality, you look at it. Oh, well, the story is about two incredibly codependent people who are also super selfish, ruin relationships, treat other people poorly in the process, and don't seem to come to any level of repentance to the process, but you're left to think, oh, isn't it nice they they wind up together for 60 years and they die together, isn't it romantic? But you gloss over the filmmaker and we as society gloss over these things, which might not be directly sinful, but they're very harmful. Yeah. Yeah. And because I think in some ways what media has done is it's it's like dramatized evil in this way that it has made it this very hard to truly understand like this. Because as soldiers says, it cuts it cuts in down the heart of everybody. So like at one point you could be doing really good in the very next moment you could be doing evil. He even talks about like this idea of. Um, thresholds, which is a little too, I think, a little too deep for this conversation. But this idea that like going back and forth, going too much into evil. But yeah, I think so much of media is we have to portray them in this way because I think it's it's a feel good thing because yeah. we like to know we like to know what's right. We want to know who to root for. I mean, that's always a big thing with yeah. entertainment, right? Mm-hmm. And then, because I, I find it really interesting, because sometimes it's so even in some movies, and I can't really think of a good example off the top of my head. But there are some examples where they like show it's like following, let's say, like a gangster or something, right? Like somebody who's like evil, but they try to show you the opposite point. Like even something like The Godfather, right? I mean, you look at you look at that kind of movie, and you look, it's about family, right? Like we we watched, I know we watched the mini series about like the making of it, yeah. and like their whole thing is like the Italian community did not want it made. Well, yeah. specifically, the gangsters didn't want it made. But the mafia didn't want it made. The, yeah. yeah, yeah, they didn't want it made because it portrayed them as like bad people. And it's like, I mean, they are. They're killing people, right? But at the same time, there's that aspect. Where it's like they still do good. Like they still they are they do good, quote unquote, to the people. And it's kind of showing that gray area of where really humans operate. And I think that's something that makes film really impactful is when you can show that. Hey, look. Because like one of the things I mentioned before on the show I was talking about, like in this, in the one scene that really hit me, you know, the main character goes, you know, this evil person, because he's like, his like boss is telling him like, like, get this guy. And he's like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to attack this person because this could have been me. Right. right? And if I just had a different set of upbringing, that could have been me. 
I that's and, the, and I know that. I think that's the problem is because I don't think we want to see ourselves in these people. I don't yeah. think we yeah. want to see ourselves in these are hyperbolic examples, but like Hitler, Stalin, Ed Kemper, we don't want to see any trace of ourselves in those people. And so yeah. we want to create as much of a separation as possible. And, and therefore you, you treat people a certain way. And because you don't have mm -hmm. perfect information, you go overboard, you have your own issues. A lot of innocent people get caught up. You treat people uh, unjustly, but it's also, it starts with things that are way more subtle. You mentioned, um, uh, the culture of the mafia, the the idea they have is, yeah, it's all about family, but it's all about no one took care of us and we came here as immigrants. Mm -hmm. The the established government uh, worked against us. We were ostracized by the populations that were here. This is how we take care of our own. And yeah. Um, and all oh, we help the community and that's and people listening might still think, OK, yeah, but we all know the mafia is bad. But it can keep drawing it down. I mentioned the the notebook. How many how many of us in a relationship? And I don't even mean romantically. Let's let's just take you and me, right? You and I mm -hmm. are in our thirties. We're navigating our our brotherly relationship over the last several decades, and one of us has an issue with each other, right? Going back to the principle, uh, Christ says that you know leave your uh, gift at the altar and yeah. reconcile with your your brother if you have an issue. Because let's say you and I have an issue with one another. And we don't bring it up. And then, I don't know, maybe we were passive aggressive against the other one. And you, it starts this, this cycle of resentment, hurt feelings, acting based on selfishness. Yeah. And it doesn't always blow up to, to something crazy, but that's how things get to levels of infidelity, right? You, you think people who are in yeah. broken marriages and then cheat on each other, it starts because one just like, I'm a, I'm a philanderer. I just like sleeping around. No, it starts because resentment is built up and then you don't, you're not looking at the situation, um, a certain way and, and, and the relationship becomes more and more perverse, more and more separated, more and more filled with animus. And then all of a sudden you find yeah. yourself doing something you never thought you were capable of doing. Um, mm -hmm. and it's largely because the, the less you want to recognize that part of yourself, I think the ironically, the more prone you are to, um, indulging it. Yeah. Especially too, when, as we said, and it, it sort of goes back to kind of the flip side of what Solzhenitsyn said in the first quote, like, I mean, who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? Because really the answer, it's a rhetorical question, but they really, the answer is not a lot of people, right? Mm -hmm. The answer is no one does. And so what it does is- we Only God rather, can help you do it. Yeah. And, and that's exactly the point. And that we would rather keep our heart intact and let something else decay and get on and distance ourselves from something else or destroy somebody else's relationship than have us be hurt. And mm -hmm. I think that, and, and that goes back to the, his idea of, cause and specifically he, when he's talking about this idea of ideology, right? When like ideology is the, the long, and he's like talks about the social theory that leads men to justify their own actions. In some ways, ideology can even just be defined as anything as a, as broader than just like a, like a set of beliefs, like that's more of like politically aligned, right? Like ideology, like communism as an ideology, capitalism, or like free, free market democracy as a, as a type of ideology. We can just have a selfish ideology where it's about us yeah. in a broader sense. And of course, you know, as you, as, as I think very many people who are listening and watching can identify, okay, well, yeah, you know, the Nazis had an ideology, they hated Jews. And so it led them to justify their own actions. Mm -hmm. Same with, um, and same with the Soviet Union, that part of their ideology is they don't want to admit when they're wrong. So, okay, you know, 30 million Ukrainians are starved in the 50s or the 30s. Yeah. And then and then I just finished rewatching um Chernobyl, the the miniseries on Chernobyl, right? And that's so the point. Watch. <laughs> yeah, the whole point of that documentary is that the Soviet Union would not admit that they had a the lead, was it lead tips or carp graphite tips that after the emergency, uh, after an emergency shutdown, and they go back in, would initially cause more, would cause this chain reaction, which would actually cause the reactor to explode. Yeah. yeah, and then of course they, the the official Soviet 
uh, this is just a fun fact, but just talking, well, fun fact, sad fact. And, and this goes to evil, though, too, is this idea that Soviet Union, I think, is still set at, like the official account for people who died. And I think it's still is like the Russian official account for people who have died as opposed or as uh, from the journal was like 30. And then when you look at it, the numbers are actually like 30,000. Yeah. Because of the people who then radiation sickness moving on and just the amount of people that probably died or got cancer from yeah. this. And that that's also a type of evil because they're justifying their actions that kill them. They want to hide because then they also do the same thing as individuals. We yeah. hide. We don't, we don't admit that we do things. And the thing that's interesting is, and these examples are not meant to condemn. I'll even throw myself into mm -hmm. a lot of these is that we all have to recognize that the things we do to justify come from the same place that the Soviet Union leaders came from. It's the same motivation yeah. that motivates serial killers, addicts, the, every, when, for example, you get a, a marriage that's on the rocks, right? And you hear all the time, one, one set of the argument yeah. is, well, this is better for the uh, the kids, you know, like they don't, you don't want to be, they don't want to be around uh, parents who don't love each other anymore and are fighting all the time. And, uh, what is love? To, or when they, yeah, and when they talk to the, <laughs> when they talk to the, their kids, it's, oh, don't worry. You are always going to be the most important thing. But in reality, that's a justification. If it was the most important thing, then you'd be doing what was best for that kid and not what was, yeah. what felt good for you in that relationship. Similarly, you can do the same thing on the opposite side. Two people who are in that same situation go, we're going to stick it out for the kids, but don't change anything. They're in like an incredibly hostile environment yeah. and the kids are yeah. uh, in fight or flight mode all the time because there's so much conflict. And again, I don't mean to, I mean, we're both single guys. I don't mean to deflect this away, mm -hmm. but the things in my yeah. life that I go to that are crutches, I see from the same lens. It's that same motivation that I see motivating other people to do those same things that motivate people when in positions of power to result in the deaths of millions, yeah. that capacity is in me. And yeah. that to your point before only God can, can change your heart to get rid of that old man. Mankind cannot do it ourselves. We can't self govern. We can't choose yeah. right uh, effectively. Yeah. And it's interesting because when you, you brought up that idea because and this goes back to what we're talking about the two trees in that we make a choice to either split up right to talk about the marriage example split up or stay together and not change but we don't because if we really were thinking big picture here about the choices we made then we potentially think well how is this actually going to affect my kid who's maybe seven now when he's 17 or when he's 27 or when he's 37 right and and that and and you would you mentioned before like the example of the mother who you know abuses her son because she had got issues with men yeah i mean that specific example i mean i know i know the the famous like serial killer example you're talking about there but yeah i mean that happens more frequently than people think and it leads it may not lead to someone being a serial killer but it may lead to that kid doing the same exact thing with their mate right and likely and, will. and that's the thing yeah, and likely with very highly likely, right? Like we're talking high percentage likelihoods of this kind of stuff happening. And that's just and that's just part of the of that's also part of the literature. But I think it's also it's also a testament to what to to how God works in that his law, his spiritual law is not just a spiritual law that has no physical consequences. When we don't obey the law, it's like not obeying gravity, right? Like there's a consequence when you jump up, you come down. When you don't obey God's law, there are consequences. And we see the consequence. I mean, and that's, and that goes back to right, Adam and Eve. The consequence was that within one generation, he had murder. And then within, I don't remember the specific years, but then, I mean, within eight chapters, less than eight chapters of Genesis, the entire world's wiped out because yeah. of how evil everybody is. But yeah. it's interesting because because he even, and I think I was reading this randomly the other day. Uh, I, was, I think I was doing some study on the on the evil and, and that scripture came up. I think it was in Genesis 8 when Noah did a, I think he did a sacrifice right after um, the rain. And he said it was a sweet smelling savor knowing though that the, the hearts of men would still be evil it's something yeah. like that i'd have to look it back up but it's something like we're like god knew that 
He could he could wipe out all of the evil people, but it still not work because evil cuts through the heart of every person. Yeah. And it's it's one of those things where evil is insidious. The more we try to make it, like we said, black and white or hyperbolic, then we ignore the evil in ourselves, the evil that is smaller and that festers and that uh, yeah. becomes more and more malignant. It was interesting, you know, a, a mutual friend of ours um, played saxophone with us in the, the coffee house days. He's got two young daughters. And um, I remember him saying to me that, you know, it's, you know, it's interesting because I recognize as the father in, in, in my house that, my daughter's relationship with me is going to largely determine her relationship with men the rest of her life. And I'm, I'm so proud of this guy for, for living the way he does. He's a, he's a great dude. Yeah, he's but, great. But um, that really is, I mean, it's, it's inescapable. You, we all grew up in a, in a family environment and that's where we get the information inputs. And when you leave that environment, if you haven't, if the only input of information has been, a marriage that didn't work, parents who showed love a certain way, whether, you know, there's a million different mm -hmm. things. You, you weren't allowed to question your parents or only your dad was able to show anger or uh, you weren't able to talk about family issues or the issues going on in, in the marriage uh, or your your mom or dad jumped from one relationship to the, the next growing up. That's your only input. That's all you know. So you can't, it's not like yeah. you're, you're not stuck in that forever, but it's going to take something dramatic to, to break that cycle. It's going to take uh, an issue in your own life, a, a lot of yeah. reading and work and trying to, to break that cycle because we only have the information we have. And conversion for those of us who are fortunate enough to be called in this lifetime, um, that, that blessing of change, of course, is is God's Holy Spirit, which is uh, yeah. a big thing that that helps you um, do it. Yeah, and it's interesting because I think and you may have used these specific words, but this is definitely the gist here again: is that like be evil begetting evil, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's an important thing, and it's also important to to say that and I, that going back to the definition that we talked about earlier, this idea that evils, anything that is either contrary to the mind of, of Christ or separates God, however you want to define it in those kinds of terms, it doesn't take a lot. It doesn't take a big evil for you to then within a couple generations, it get pretty big, right? I mean, you'll, I mean, we, we've, we've hit the two trees so frequently in this, in this podcast, because I mean, it just makes sense, right? I mean, it's the first couple chapters of Genesis and it, it's the whole reason why it's like this, but yeah, within a couple of generations, it is where it is. And yet you may not think that your your sin or your evil, so it's not as bad, but it's still bad. And it doesn't mean that that just because yours is worse, like, oh well, you know, I didn't commit adultery. Doesn't mean your kid won't. Doesn't mean that, you know, somebody else down the line in your family is not going to. It's a matter of, as we said, like going through this process, acknowledging that our nature, who we truly are in this sense. And then going through, like, honestly, just, just read Romans 6, 7, and 8, and probably just the entire book of Romans. And and obviously, right, like, there's just so much depth there. Psalm that Paul 51. Really digs into. Yeah, Psalm 51, that whole that that whole section of David talking what Bathsheba is, it's a huge, really important, it's like, you have to do that. That submission to God is the only thing that is really going to be able to get you through this process. And of course, like Soul's Edition doesn't talk about God very mm -hmm. often in here, but he still sees it, which is really interesting, this yeah. whole concept. And it's important that we understand that difference because like we don't need to do huge evil to commit huge wrongs. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I've seen it in my own life that it doesn't even need to be like generational that you could, you could have this line and then you make a justification to cross it when it comes to these actions. And then a couple of years later, you're like, man, what, how did I get here? And, and all of a sudden it's yeah. much harder to reset that and whatever, but I want to, I want to transition to another, yeah, you have, an, you have a, a thought before I move on? No, it's, there's this Solzhenitsyn has the exact quote that like pretty much says that um, it's the threshold quote I was talking about where he's like, the closer yeah. you, the more and more you do evil, the harder and harder it is to go all the way back. Like if you just continuously do evil, right. And, and he compares it to like physics, right? Like there's a point at which you hit in like chemistry and stuff like that, right? There's a point at which like freezing temperature, right? You hit, you hit zero degrees Celsius 
water freezes. And he, his theory is that you hit a certain point in evil and you can't go back, which that's something probably a larger discussion than this, but the yeah. idea of thresholds, like it makes it a lot harder to, to do that. And of course, when we're talking about God's Holy Spirit, I think it also works in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. The more and more you work with God's Holy Spirit and submit to it, I think the harder it is to do evil purely because of the fact that you understand. And it's, and of course though, it's, that's also, I would say a slightly overgeneralization, but I think it's something to, to like, at least meditate on and be like, you know, the more we have, I mean, just look at, at, at Christ, right? Like the fullness of the spirit. And he didn't sin because it wasn't in his nature. Yeah. That's just something we won't be able to attain, attain in this life. But it's, I think the symbolism is there looking at what Christ was able to achieve with the fullness and what we will achieve at, his re at the resurrection. Yeah. And, and I think the, the last thing I'd like to touch on is, um, a, I think you have a, a, a quote from the book about this too, but it was something you and I talked about recently. And that is the quote that everyone knows and cites all the time, which is, uh, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. Now, apparently mm -hmm. I found out that no one really knows uh, who said that people attribute it to Edmund Burke, but it's actually not uh, his quote, apparently. But let's really try to analyze that. I don't really I don't believe that's even true. It, the only thing mm. the only thing is is to do nothing. First of all, again, who's to say that the that evil at any given point uh, like we talked about are people who don't they don't believe they're doing evil. They believe they're doing good. And also that yeah. presupposes that once the good people uh, beat the evil people, they won't have uh, caused collateral damage and evil of their own. I mean, yeah. you even talk about, uh, you could mention anything, World War II, the war on terror. You don't think that, uh, even if you think there is a, a, a good side or a better side, you don't think we caused uh, chaos and and evil as a result. We didn't do evil things uh, in the process of pursuing that. Like it's, it's number one, overly simplistic. And sometimes in scripture even indicates this, the right thing to do is to do nothing or yeah, okay. because God has to do something. Right. Or so the only thing for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. Okay. So let, does that mean that anything a good person does is good? It is Proverbs, yeah. Proverbs uh, 15, one says a soft word turns away wrath, uh, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So what happens if a good person takes an action that stirs up an evil person? He might inflame uh, an evil man. Yeah, I think part of, I think the biggest issue with that quote is what is a good person and what is an evil person? Yeah. Right. Because because it, then it goes back to what we're talking about is there are definitions of people that, oh, well, if we just get rid of the evil people, yeah. then everything will be fine. When so like, because when you define good and, and this goes back to what Christ said, why are you calling me good? None, none are good. Right. That aspect, because that is a huge thing, because if you just believe and probably that person did right, that there are just good people and there are bad people. And yeah. It is a war between the two, and w w evil will triumph if we do nothing. Is what he's probably what he's saying. But of course, it's like, well, how do you know that all the, your, your good people are at, are not also evil people? Because according to Solzhenitsyn, good and evil is in every single one of us. And of yeah. course, that's according just in scripture. scripture too, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like yeah, and and that's either the... way there. And that's such a, I think that's the, the takeaway from all this is, and I think what it should lead to is humility because, mm -hmm. you know, at least the older I get and the more I learn about things, the more I realize I do not know. And the mm -hmm. more certain things become more ambiguous and that should lead to surrender to God because God is the only one yeah. that even if we're a hundred percent well-intentioned all the time, which none of us are we don't have enough yeah. information to make the right decision. I mean, the, the great leap forward in China was, a, was an <laughs> yeah. accident. They, they killed yeah. millions of people uh, via starvation because of a bad policy because, because of an accident, essentially like we have the capacity to do great evil when not trying to do great evil. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the, and I think that's the thing that, is really and, and I think that, and almost in some ways it seems almost like a modern phenomenon because we have such a greater reach now, right? Like I don't think that kind of policy could have happened 
in ancient times. I mean, maybe when you're no. talking about like empires, right? Like maybe like in Egypt, right? They could have a stupid policy and you could kill a lot of people. But I mean, the the numbers of people, like right, we're talking under Mao in, in China, like in the 50s and 60s. We're talking. I mean, that's only because of modern technology and the mass of people that we can actually do something like that. I think it's it's hard for our intentions to. It was harder for intentions to, to be as per- pervasive, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen, right? It didn't mean that bad. In, it didn't mean that bad intention or uh, that good intentions. I mean, I guess that's the quote, right? Like that the the, the, pa- the path to hell is paved with good intentions. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's also one of those. I've seen it enough in my life where, whether it's in our family or in a romantic relationship uh, of mine, me doing something that I believe is right might result in a bad thing uh, in the relationship or for that other person because. Uh, either I don't have sufficient information. I might be, maybe I'll see it in two years that I'm wrong about it, but at the moment mm-hmm. I don't, or it yeah. could just be crossed wires. I, I think I, I think I mentioned this in a, um, the Gary Petty episode of the podcast, but that especially in family dynamics, like with you and I, I've seen it definitely, or in my romantic relationships is I view love in a certain way. I view the expression of love in a certain way. So if you or the the girl I'm dating it, don't express it in that way, I internalize it as you don't love me or vice versa. I might express it in a way that's showing love on my end, but for you, it might seem like rejection or criticism or for the person I'm dating, it might seem that way. And yeah. it's the spiral of, of negativity. So even like we are mm-hmm. all, it's like whatever the great leap forward equivalent is in terms of our relationships. <laughs> we all do that stuff yeah, all the yeah. time. And that's why you pick any period in human history and I have a hard time saying any period is any more evil or less evil than any other. Um, yeah, because it's just different, right? Yeah, I mean, the idea that if ancient if ancient peoples had modern technology, would they do the same things we do? Probably. I yeah. mean, there probably would have been tons of massacres if if uh, if the if the Catholic Church during the Spanish Inquisition had modern technology. Yeah, yeah. they probably would have killed a lot more people, right? I mean, it's just it's just stuff like you just don't know. It's also it's those kind of things are almost pointless to talk about in terms of. You know, hypotheticals, oh, well, yeah. was it more evil? Yeah, the hypotheticals, because the point is whether or not it's more evil or not as evil, it's still evil, right? It's, it's, I remember you said this a couple of weeks ago. It's like the decision between the lesser of two evils is still choosing evil, right? Yeah. Like there's no getting around it in, in that case. And I think it's the same here. It's like admit that it's evil and that this world is not perfect and that you live in the time you live in. And you have to deal with what you have to deal with. I mean, yeah. right? That's just, I, think, I think that's the bottom line. I think most importantly, too, for us in the church is acknowledge you have that capacity. Acknowledge that we all yeah. want. And again, it's it's Romans seven. Romans seven is the theme scripture. It's even Paul when yeah. once he was converted is talking about there. We are all at war with ourselves. We're at war with yeah. uh, the. There's a. a the law of sin and death waging war on our members. We're we're at war. The 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 spirit of God in us is at war with our carnal nature that we still have. And that battle is going to be ongoing. And so I think what it probably should result in is us being able to acknowledge that we don't know everything, being able to acknowledge that we're going to make a mistake and hopefully own that to the people in our lives. If we make a mistake and hopefully that number one limits damage, you're never going to get rid of it, but hopefully that makes you grow closer to God. Cause I think that is a prerequisite in conversion is like that you have to realize the capacity for evil yeah. and truly repent of your of your nature yeah and so i think this actually might be a good point for me to read this last quote um because mm-hmm. it, it deals with this particular thing like understanding our nature and I, we, we've referenced it a couple times in terms of this idea that you know when you look at someone or say an incident that could be evil seeing yourself in it and this is a quote uh, from the book interestingly enough it's Two paragraphs after the 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 line the line between good and evil cuts through the heart of every man, Solzhenitsyn says, "Confronted by the pit into which we are about to toss those who have done us harm, we halt, stricken dumb. It is, after all, only because of the way things worked out that they were the executioners and we weren't." Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a fantastic quote. It's the year. Yeah. I don't, I don't think it's hyperbolic. I think a lot of people, um, 
would say it is, but all of us are just one or two different things or circumstances or crises away from, from doing, doing great evil. Every political party, every group yeah. of people is one or two steps away from being the executioners, from being the one throwing people mm -hmm. into the gulags. That's why we need God. We need Christ to return. And there is no other solution. Anyone who tells you there's a different solution other than Christ's return is a snake oil salesman. I mean, not that that's intentional, but that's essentially what they're mm -hmm. selling. They're, they're selling falsehood. Yes, exactly. I couldn't agree more. I think this is such an important, especially, I mean, I know a lot of people will say, you know, oh, you know, this is the worst I've ever seen it. It, you know, it's so bad uh, today and these days. And, you know, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe this is the worst time, but, you know, as time goes on, we're not getting farther away from the end. And so I think it's something that we all need to really look in internally on this, be introspective on this and I, and say, where can I go wrong? Where can I do this? I mean, I've, I've mentioned this so many times, Matthew 24, where it talks about the love of many will grow cold. It's agape. I mm -hmm. think a lot of people probably know that, but it's good to think about and say, well, what does that mean? The love of many will grow cold. Is that the church? Are we talking about people in the church that yeah. are good, that this is going to happen? And is and, and of course, and Christ even says, I mean, that, you know, brother, brother will turn against brother. I mean, in that situation that Solzhenitsyn's talking about, right? Like, are you going to look at that person and and realize, no, that could have been me? Mm -hmm. Or do you want that person to be you? Right? I mean, when I mean, you look at it, like, try I think that's an important thing to think about. Can this be me? Will it be me? And do I allow it to be me? Yeah. Yeah. Great points, man. Always great having you on. We'll, uh, we'll get be you back. Yeah, we'll get you back on for uh, another podcast in the future. Thanks again, Steve. Great talking yeah. as always.